Good morning, everyone. Um, and uh, welcome to another in our series of discussions um, this year, co-organized by uh, CSIS Great Chair and the Global Peace Foundation. Uh, my name is Victor Chai. I'm um, um, uh, the CSIS Career Chair and Senior Advisor here, as well as uh, Professor of Government at Georgetown University. Um, and today's discussion is on China's policy towards Korean Peninsula unification. Um, our featured remarks today will be by uh, Sid Seiler, who is the Special Envoy for the Six-Party Talks at the Department of State. Uh, that will be followed by a roundtable discussion uh, involving um, myself, uh, Sid Seiler, and Professor John Chow from American uh, University. Um, so to help start us off, I want to give an opportunity to my uh, co-organizer uh, of the, this series of talks, uh, Mike Marshall, who is the Director of Research and Publications at the Global Peace Foundation, an opportunity to say a few words. Thank you, Victor. Uh, on behalf of the Global Peace Foundation, the, the co-sponsor of this forum series, I'd like to welcome you all and, and thank you for coming. I'd also particularly like to thank Victor, Ellen, Kim, and all the CSIS team uh, for, for working together with us uh, to put together this series, uh, which takes a fresh look at aspects of Korean unification and Korea's changing place in the world. This is the third of five joint forums, and I hope you'll follow the subsequent sessions, which will look at the roles of Russia and Japan, respectively, uh, in relation to Korean unification. The Global Peace Foundation is an international nonprofit committed to exploring and promoting innovative values-based approaches to peace building and development. We're active in the US, in Korea, and 13 other countries across Asia, Africa, and Latin America, promoting initiatives for community development and national transformation. The idea for this forum series originated in great part uh, from this book, uh, the Korean Dream, A Vision for a United Korea, published last September in Korea and written by Dr. Hyunjin Moon, founder and chairman of the Global Peace Foundation. The book proposes new approaches and a new framework for thinking about Korean unification. In particular, it stresses the Korean identity shared by the people of both North and South and based on the long span of Korean history and the principles and values that have informed it. Those of you familiar with Korean cultural history uh, will know the concept of Hongik Ingan, or living for the benefit of all humanity, for example. Such a framework has the potential to transcend the political divisions within South Korea and the ideological divisions between North and South, which are, after all, the products of a mere 70 years of recent history. The book also highlights the role of civil society organizations in building bridges across the nations and among the peoples of the region, and ultimately as a key component of any successful unification process. This was the focus of our, our last forum last month. A practical expression of this idea is the formation in South Korea of Action for Korea United, a coalition of over 400 NGOs and civil society groups concerned with issues related to unification. The Global Peace Foundation was a key mover in setting up this organization. In the existing political and diplomatic stalemate on the peninsula, the book and the Global Peace Foundation are committed to finding new approaches to unification and new approaches to thinking about the Northeast Asia region as a whole. The emergence of a new geopolitical context out of the old Cold War framework offers new opportunities for economic development and security arrangements in Northeast Asia. Korea in unification will likely prove a keystone in realizing these opportunities. China's role will be critical for the future prospects of the region, as it will for any unification process. We've already witnessed significant change in China's relations with both Koreas. I hope that this forum will stimulate some new ideas about the relations of China with other key regional players that can uh, further the peace and development of the region. Look forward very much to your discussions. Thank you. Uh, 
Uh, thanks, Mike. Um, and so our featured uh, remarks today will be by um, Sid Seiler and let me properly, he, although he, I think he's well known to many of you here, um, uh, let me just properly introduce him uh, to you. Um, Sid Seiler is the, currently the Special Envoy at the State Department for the Six Party Talks. And in this capacity, he coordinates U.S. efforts on denuclearization of North Korea through the Six Party Talks framework and leads the day-to-day -day engagement with Six Party partners. Um, uh, prior to doing this, uh, Sid served on the National Security Council as a director for Korea um, from uh, April 2011 to August uh, 2014. And there, basically, any piece of paper that got near the National Security Advisor or the President that had, or the Vice President that had anything to do with Korea had to go through Sid. Based on my own past experience, that's been the job. Um, uh, but Sid also has been a member of the Senior National Intelligence Service and previously served as the Deputy DNI National Intelligence Manager for North Korea and worked on a variety of assignments um, across the intelligence community related to Korea. He is truly a veteran of uh, the six party talks in the sense that there are probably, you can count maybe on one hand, uh, the number of people in the US government that have been involved in the six party talks from the beginning um, to where uh, we are today with the Obama administration. There are not many, and Sid is one of those few who were involved from the, from the very beginning. Um, uh, so in case that's not enough to convince you that he's a Korea expert and one of the top Korea experts in the U.S. government, he also has an M.A. in Korean studies uh, from Yonsei University's graduate school, and he's written a book about Kim Il-sung, um, 1941 to 1948, the creation of a legend, the building of a regime, and a book that I um, cited quite a bit in my own uh, book, The Impossible State on North Korea, because it was a fantastic source. Um, so Sid, it's uh, always a pleasure to welcome you back to CSIS. Um, you're a good friend and a good colleague, and we want to thank you for taking the time to join us today. Victor, thank you so much for the very uh, kind introduction. Uh, it's an honor to be here today to discuss this topic that's really grown so much in interest over the past few years. It's generated much discussion. It's even tickled the imagination of many people as we consider the current issues we face on the Korea Peninsula and how difficult as they may be. And, but more importantly, what does the future hold? When Victor invited me to speak here today on this topic, uh, he suggested, and I agreed, that we'd uh, begin with a brief laydown of current U.S. efforts on the North Korea issue and the state of diplomatic play, because this would provide a helpful context for the discussion uh, that would follow. And the reason that's so is because in many ways the dynamics today, the coordination, uh, the transparency, the habits of cooperation that the actors are developing in their efforts to resolve this very difficult issue of the denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula will certainly have a direct bearing on how we together cooperate on the full range of issues related to the future of the Korean Peninsula, which we'll discuss uh, today. But let me open with a bottom line statement. Our DPRK policy continues to be designed to explore and as possible, create diplomatic opportunities toward negotiated denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula, while at the same time prudently ensuring deterrence and pressure to ensure the security of the United States and its allies. In other words, while we pursue diplomacy where possible, we employ pressure as necessary and ensure deterrence. I've used other forms to emphasize our efforts and success of our policy in slowing and impeding the growth of the North Korea nuclear and missile capabilities through pressures and sanctions, our success in neutralizing the, emergency DP the emerging DPRK threat through our ongoing efforts to ensure deterrence. I refer you most recently to the April 15th announcement following the Korean Integrated Defense Dialogue of the formation of a deterrence strategy committee yet further evidence and further evolution of our commitment to further strengthen the USROK Alliance's capability to respond to whatever threat it may face, as it has successfully for the last 60 years. 
that the U.S. ROK alliance remains strong, that security on the peninsula is ensured, that the region continues to prosper while North Korea's isolation and hardships continue. All this serves as a clear demonstration of the success of our overall response to the North Korea issue. But in the spirit of today's discussion, I'd like to examine specifically how our diplomatic strategy tackles both the near-term goal of returning North Korea to authentic and credible six-party talks marked by concrete denuclearization steps, while at the same time pursuing longer-term objectives related to the future of the peninsula. To do that, I'd like to review three principal fundamental policy principles that have guided our policy over the, the past six years that remain relevant today. Policy principles are, are really a critical element in understanding our approach because they represent enduring precepts based upon our accumulated knowledge and experience working this hard issue, while at the same time avoiding dogmatic inflexibility uh, and, and ensuring that we have creative yet managed risk-taking opportunities to try to move forward. The first of these principles is what we call our principle of sharpening choices. We've repeatedly demonstrated to the leadership of North Korea that it faces two paths going forward. The path of denuclearization that would lead to the prosperity and security it purports to seek uh, for its people, or its current path of ignoring its international obligations and commitments, and facing, as a result, even greater diplomatic and economic isolation and pressure. Uh, to sharpen those choices for North Korea, to make sure they have you know, laser accurate uh, understanding of, of the paths that are before it. The U.S. has left the door open for Pyongyang uh, to move down the path of denuclearization, a fundamental improvement of U.S. DPRK relations and integration into the international community, even as we've been firm in holding Pyongyang accountable for its bad behavior. This sharpening choices principle requires engagement, and we do this. We do this by regularly engaging Pyongyang, as we have over the past six years, by not being ideologically opposed to talking, by being willing to probe North Korea's intentions and prod it to make the right decisions, by testing propositions while taking calculated risks to explore new possibilities, and to quote the president uh, in describing his overall foreign policy strategy by engaging while preserving all of our capabilities. We've done this again repeatedly over the last six years, and will continue to do so. You know, progress in our nuclear talks with Iran clearly demonstrates our willingness to engage countries with whom the United States has had long-standing differences. Uh, and there should be no doubt we continue to remain committed to, negoti to, to negotiations and a negotiated resolution of the DPRK nuclear issue on the basis of the 2005 joint statement of the six-party talks the fundamental roadmap for achieving the complete, verifiable, and irreversible denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula. It is the DPRK, however, that has not yet decided to embark on this path. It has repeatedly rejected offers for dialogue. It has repeatedly and openly violated commitments made in the September 19, 2005 joint statement to abandon its nuclear program. It continues to ignore its international obligations, particularly those under United Nations Security Council resolutions that call on the DPRK to halt its nuclear activities and to refrain from ballistic missile launches. And of course, uh, it has openly declared an intent to attempt to expand its nuclear deterrent while pursuing economic development as part of its so-called Pyongyang policy. All that said, we are not deterred from our uh, continued efforts uh, to pursue denuclearization as our top priority, and we maintain a robust pace of diplomacy toward that goal. We remain in close contact with other six-party partners uh, on our shared goal of denuclearization of the Korean, Korean Peninsula in a peaceful manner. We continue to offer an alternative path for the DPRK. But with over two years of experience with, with DPRK obfuscation and recalcitrance and an absence of any sign Pyongyang is currently prepared to engage on denuclearization steps, we will continue to judge North Korea by its action and not by its words. 
This leads to our second principle, and I'll just touch on it very briefly, although it's very critical, and that is of putting alliances first. Putting alliances first. Close, continuous, and transparent coordination between Washington and Seoul, and of course with Tokyo as well, has been and will continue to be the centerpiece of our approach to North Korea. In this regard, we fully support President Park and her untiring efforts to move inter-Korea relations forward. Assistant Secretary Danny Russell, in comments here back in December, noted the strong U.S. support for President Park for her North Korea policy and the trust-building process with its balance of principle and pragmatism. Of President Park's vision and the positive and vivid picture that she has painted of the benefits the North Korean people could reap from reconciliation and denuclearization, and indeed the benefits to the region unification would bring. It is disappointing, though perhaps not surprising, that Pyongyang continues to ignore important opportunities for restoring inter-Korea relations, for moving down this path that President Park has laid out. All that said, we will continue to work closely together with our Republic of Korea partners, extending a hand to Pyongyang, leaving a door open, but at the same time balancing principle and pragmatism. The third principle of our North Korea policy approach is that of close coordination with China, one of our topics for today. Over the past two years, in fact, particularly following North Korea's egregious provocations in the late 2012, early 2013 time period that included a long-range missile launch, its third nuclear test, military shows of force, the United States and China have worked closely to align and confirm and reconfirm our common goals. Like the United States, and I would actually suggest our close allies in the Republic of Korea and Japan, China seeks peace and stability in Northeast Asia. So do we. China seeks denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula as a foundation upon which lasting peace and stability is, peace and stability is truly attainable. So do we. China understands the economic benefits of a peaceful and stable Korea Peninsula. So do we. That's what we've been doing for 60-some years through the USROK alliance. And as a path toward these broader goals, China seeks a return of North Korea to authentic and credible denuclearization negotiations. So do we. This consensus can, I believe, serve as a solid foundation for moving forward in the months and years ahead. These three goals are inseparable. There really can be no true peace, stability, tension reduction on the Korea Peninsula without denuclearization. Authentic and credible negotiations leading to concrete denuclearization steps alone will lead to sustainable reduced tensions. Negotiations, on the other hand, not marked by clear progress on denuclearization are of little value particularly to the degree that they put at risk the important pressure and deterrence capabilities we have in place. Uh, such talks for the sake of talks are far from being cost-free. But I tend to be bullish when it comes to the longer-term prospects for cooperation in this regard. In addition to the shared consensus with China I just described, another equally encouraging development has been the improvement of PRC ROK relations over the past two years. Increasingly, there's a clear recognition in Beijing of the value of a close and productive relationship with Seoul that is in China's interest, and indeed the interest of all parties involved. Beijing's two-way trade alone is, with the ROK is approximately 45 times as much as PRC, DPRK trade. President Xi has now met on several separate occasions with President Park geun including reciprocal state visits to each other's capitals. The improvement in relations between these two important neighbors is clear to everybody. The linkage of interest between these two neighbors is well known. Indeed, it's a foundation about which this very uh, discussion we're about to have may be had. Uh, so we do go forward with a shared goal for the Korea Peninsula of denuclearization, peace, stability, and prosperity. And it's increasingly clear that it is Seoul and not Pyongyang that is the natural partner for Beijing as it looks to the future in the region and on the peninsula. So our policies, the policies of Washington, Seoul, and Beijing 
must by design have a bold and wide-ranging vision that looks beyond the immediate issues before us. Yes, we will continue to exert all efforts to bring Pyongyang back to authentic and credible negotiations that lead to concrete denuclearization steps, to restore and bring to consummation the letter and spirit of September 19, 2005 joint statement, to be sure we will continue to sharpen Pyongyang's choices, making clear that moving down the, the path that is uh, uh, the true way to security and prosperity it seeks, one of denuclearization uh, is one choice. Well, the nuclear path that it is on is the arduous dead end path that will lead to continued diplomatic isolation and economic hardship. As we sharpen these choices, we do so with a vision toward the future, toward a future Korean peninsula that is marked by stability, denuclearization, political and economic freedom, and a respect for human dignity. There's no reason why the people of North Korea don't deserve this. There's no reason why the people of North Korea should be denied the growth, prosperity, advancement, respect for human rights that we see uh, growing throughout the region. But even as we do this, we certainly cannot and will not wait. We can't wait for Pyongyang to come to its decision. We must continue to plan, to collaborate, to brainstorm, and yes, even debate issues, such as we plan to today. To do so demonstrates a sense of realism about the future, transparency about our intentions, and boldness to prepare and shape events before they unfold. Only by doing so can we lay the groundwork for the type of unification that leads to a peninsula free of war, free of nuclear weapons, and just plain free. Thank you. Great, thank you. Um, uh, thanks, Sid. That was a um, fantastic way to get us started. Uh, we'll now begin a discussion on um, the points you've raised as well as others. And um, uh, first, we have to give apologies for Chris Johnson, who was the senior advisor and Freeman chair here. He has an illness in the family and was not able to join us uh, at the last minute, and he sends his apologies. Um, uh, but alongside Chris, we have uh, John Chow, who's professor of international relations at American University. Let me properly introduce him to you as well. He is uh, the chair of the Asian Studies Program Research Council at American University uh, and has served as director of the Division of Comparative and Regional Studies. He is a specialist in international relations and comparative politics focusing on East Asia. He's the author of Interpreting Chinese Foreign Policy, which won the Best Academic Book Award by the Ministry of Culture of the Republic of Korea and he's also the author of Japanese Policy Making. His most recent book is Managing the China Challenge, Perspectives from the Globe. Um, uh, Dr. Zhao spent one year as a senior fellow at the US Institute of Peace in Washington and at the East-West Center in Hawaii. He's testified on China's economic development at the US Congress and has served as a consultant for the United Nations. Um, he received his BA from Peking University and MA and PhD from the University of California at Berkeley. So we'll begin um, the discussion by having uh, Dr. Chow offer some remarks, and then we'll, uh, we'll have more of a roundtable discussion. So Dr. Chow, thank you for joining us this morning. Sure. Thank you. Uh, and uh, thank you for your wonderful lecture. Thank you. Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, it is my task to give some of my own thought over China's foreign, Chinese foreign policy toward the Korea Peninsula in connection with the early presentation. Uh, I did send a uh, PowerPoint file, but I was told it's not necessary here, so just the free discussion would be better. Uh, my thinking of uh, Chinese foreign policy evolution uh, toward the Korea Peninsula, uh, I use the term so-called three approaches. Uh, the first one, uh, what I call it, is a history embedded, uh, namely uh, Chinese foreign policy toward the Korean Peninsula, very much influenced by 
uh, not only uh, centuries long history uh, between China and Korea, uh, we can trace back all the way to early relations, but also to the very recent, like the Korea War and uh, among others. Uh, the second approach I uh, developed is uh, national interest driven. Uh, that is uh, when Deng Xiaoping uh, uh, started the open and the reform policy, that modernization uh, became the top priority of Chinese foreign policy. And that, along that line, uh, China's uh, national interest priorities changed. Uh, so we started in that particular landmark development that was 1992 normalization between South Korea mm -hmm. and uh, uh, China. Uh, so-called, at that time, so-called equal distance with Pyongyang and with Seoul. Uh, but the third approach, what I call it, uh, is co-management approach. Uh, that is in response to uh, the development, is China rising, uh, and then uh, the uh, so-called responsible stakeholder and China need to develop and to exercise uh, more uh, global governance perspective. In that particular case, uh, the co-management approach. Uh, when I say co-management approach is very much to do uh, with six-party talks. Uh, that uh, uh, China, to begin with, China was reluctant, uh, but then China and the United States played a leading role, uh, and together with other partners, uh, and then uh, even though uh, we is on and off uh, picture six party talks, but I use that as an example of China's co-management co approach. Uh, so that is, uh, the three approaches, I, what, what I would say is the evolution of a Chinese foreign policy toward Korea Peninsula. Mm -hmm. It's very much clear that it's nowadays national interest driven uh, and co-management, uh, global responsibility uh, has become a, a priority thinking uh, of Chinese foreign policy toward the Korea Peninsula. I, I fully agree. Uh, with Sydney's early comment uh, about uh, the consensus between Washington and Beijing uh, in terms of uh, stability and peace. And uh, nuclear-free Korea Peninsula, uh, I think that's uh, indeed uh, its top priority as well for Beijing. Now the key point uh, up to early this spring uh, and even summer uh, 2015 is how we would approach to uh, the six party talks. I'm glad that uh, you is a special envoy. I understand that there are still uncertainty uh, about uh, uh, and a different assessment about the utilities of six party talks. Uh, and uh, if you look at the uh, uh, most recent development uh, that is very clearly uh, that uh, Beijing's uh, approach uh, is really continue to develop uh, close relations with Washington uh, cooperation over Korea Peninsula, and in particular with uh, uh, Park Geun-hye's government. Uh, if you look at the, just a couple of weeks ago, uh, the development of AIIB uh, it's also very clear that is uh, Beijing, South Korea, uh, together with uh, uh, altogether 57 members to become a founding member of AIIB. At the same time, according to a report, I'm not sure, I have not confirmed that, that is uh, North Korea's application was rejected mm. uh, as a member of AIIB. Uh, given uh, with the, the, the reason that is North Korea is, is not enough transparency in its uh, financial practice. Uh, I don't know internal details between Pyongyang 
and Beijing regarding this particular episode. Uh, but to me, it's very clear, because I understand there was also internal debate in Beijing and in China. Uh, that is, whether North Korea, this particular juncture, uh, China should uh, uh, either accept or not. Uh, but of course, in reality, China rejected that policy. I guess, I mean, the application from Pyongyang is give very clear signal uh, that is China would uh, continue uh, to work with other partners, particularly United States, uh, work together uh, to uh, make North Korea, uh, Korea Peninsula uh, nuclear free, particularly when facing the new leadership uh, of Kim Jong-un. You know, that's, we understand that Kim Jong-un already assumed power a few years, but never had, a, at least uh, openly, never had any official visit to Beijing. So the two leaders, uh, Xi Jinping and uh, Kim Jong-un, still not met. Uh, but we know that uh, Park Geun Hai, uh, uh, President Park Geun Hai, developed very close relations with Xi Jinping. So all of that uh, indicate uh, recent development. Having said that, I'm not saying that China will, sort of speak, give up North Korea. Uh, there are still a lot of uh, internal debate policy. Uh, some old thinking, like North Korea served as a, uh, a buffer state, that kind of still, maybe still around with, with some uh, uh, sentiment among certain parts of Chinese policy make, making and the society, even though that may not be a dominant or mainstream thinking. So nowadays, what I'm say, saying here is uh, Chinese society uh, has also become uh, much more pluralistic compared to the era of Mao. So there are indeed different schools of thought. Now, my final point, just back to uh, Sini's early comments, uh, it seems like uh, uh, Washington's policy, uh, from my understanding from your lecture, is that it now uh, has become a bit more pro pro proactive toward Korea Peninsula. Uh, there was a saying that Obama administration's policy toward Korea Peninsula is a so-called strategic patience. Uh, I did not hear any reference toward this particular. So actually, I do have a question mm -hmm. with you. That is, what does that mean uh, Washington has switched a little bit uh, uh, and toward a, a bit more proactive? And any preconditions uh, for the resuming uh, 640 talks? I guess that's uh, still a huge mm -hmm. part question. Because now, even though North Korea has a mixed uh, signals, sometimes they say, oh, no, we're not part of 640 talks anymore. Mm -hmm. But then sometimes they say, oh, no, yes, we are interested, let's resume. So with all those kind of uncertainty, different uh, mixed signals, so what exactly Washington's position? So those are my questions. Thank you. Great. Uh, thanks, Professor Zhao. So, um, so you have those questions. And let me just throw a couple more out for both of you. Mm -hmm. um, first, for uh, Professor Zhao, uh, you spoke about the evolution of China's policy towards the Korean Peninsula. Um, and what I would like to ask you is about how you think um, the current leadership, Xi Jinping in particular, how his views on the Korean Peninsula are similar to or differ from that historic trend that you that you mentioned earlier, because um, uh, clearly you know he has not met with the North Korean leadership yet, um, and it almost seems like China is being strategically patient <laughs> on North on North Korea, uh, um, uh, not just the U.S. And then for Sid, I guess the the, the question is is um, you know the uh, as we watch, uh, the, uh, the Obama administration has done some pretty big things with Cuba and with Iran uh, and with Burma. And the only country left is North Korea in that sense. And I guess there, there are two questions. One is, um, uh, what do you think the prospects are? Do you think there's any, um, anything that you see 
in, coming from North Korea that even mildly suggests that there's some opportunity to do something uh, before the end of this administration, or um, because of uh, Iran and Cuba and Burma and many other issues that the administration doesn't have the bandwidth um, in the time that's left mm -hmm. to actually engage uh, because presumably they would not just want to start a negotiation, they would want to finish it. And that would be a heavy lift um, given all that is going on. So uh, one question for each of you, maybe Professor Zhao, if you, would, you might go first on. Sure. Yeah. yeah. Uh, before I forget, uh, I would uh, like to say thank you for Victor uh, organizing such timely uh, forum and panel. And thank you for Korea Peace Foundation working together. I, I think uh, this is a really significant, and I would like to see more proactive activities from Korea chair at CSIS and uh, among others. Uh, the question about uh, Xi Jinping and the current uh, Korea policy, uh, I would say that uh, uh, it's in line with early I'm talk the three approaches evolution. Uh, however, uh, we do see a bit more assertive uh, of Chinese foreign policy uh, under Xi Jinping uh, over uh, a number of so-called uh, core national interests. Uh, having said that, uh, specifically with the Korean Peninsula, uh, we do see uh, a little bit detachment uh, between Beijing and Seoul. Uh, it's not necessarily out of Beijing's choice. Between uh, Beijing and Seoul or Beijing uh, no, and no, Pyongyang? I'm sorry, yeah. Beijing, Beijing and the Pyongyang. Yeah, yeah. Beijing and the Pyongyang, sorry. Yeah. Uh, it's, uh, my argument is not necessarily out of yeah. Beijing's choice. Uh, some, you know, with uh, unpredictable development within Pyongyang. Uh, so some, sometimes also uh, caught Beijing in surprise in many different uh, functions, uh, like uh, the, uh, the deal with uh, 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 Kim Jong-un's uncle, mm -hmm. uh, Chang Tung Du, uh, you know, situation like that. Uh, so what I'm saying here is Beijing clearly recognized uh, is limitation uh, uh, that uh, the in, in both relationship and the influence. Uh, so in that case, would rather uh, almost like a United States. Uh, the U.S. Uh, also recognize limitation by its own. Uh, there, that's the very foundation for the beginning of six party talks. So need to for. Uh, mm -hmm. fellow countries to work together. So in that particular case, and Pyongyang, for example, mm -hmm. always emphasize, we want to talk with Washington. So it seems like Pyongyang put top priority with Washington. In that case, Beijing would say, okay, if that's your choice, uh, we can wait to see. Uh, having said that, we do understand that there are some economic leverage in particular, like food and energy. Uh, I don't know details exactly, you know, because that's always changing in terms of supply. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, the one of the arguments uh, from international community is that the very survival of North Korea largely depends on uh, food and energy uh, supplied from China. Uh, but the situation may change, uh, and in particular, like I already mentioned, uh, the limitation, the limits, uh, Chinese uh, foreign policy influence over mm. Pyongyang. In that particular case, uh, I think right now, uh, the hope uh, is to work with US, with Japan, Russia, South Korea together, and uh, possibly, if possible, to resume six-party talks. And the ultimate goal is to maintain peace and stability with the Korea Peninsula. Mm -hmm. okay, thanks.
Sid? Well, I think the cases of Cuba, Iran, and Burma really uh, prove uh, parts of my presentation in terms of uh, the willingness, the flexibility, the creativity that the United States can show when it has a, a credible dialogue partner, when it has a, a counterpart with whom we've uh, long had difficulties uh, that makes a decision uh, that breaking out of their isolation, engaging the United States, uh, exploring a different path is, a, is in its nat national interest when the leadership of that country makes that decision. And in each of those cases, uh, you know, uh, skeptics could argue the jury's out, but in any case, we had uh, three instances where, uh, you know, the country responded to, you know, our offer to reach out a hand to those who would uh, unclinch their fists. Mm -hmm. I think it shows U.S. intent and bandwidth. Uh, Lord knows we've put together a team on North Korea uh, that has a lot of experience. Uh, Sung Kim, Danny Russell, myself, Evan Medeiros, and Allison Hook over at the NSC, not to mention you know, the, the uh, uh, relentless pursuit of diplomatic solutions that uh, our leadership has, has demonstrated repeatedly. There is no question of bandwidth on North Korea. Uh, you know, the, 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 the challenge we face now and have faced over the last six years is uh, Pyongyang's responsiveness and their commitment to return to what we have called authentic and credible uh, six-party negotiations. We have shown a flexibility, as you know, toward uh, talks with North Korea. We're not afraid of talking to North Korea. We're not ideologically opposed to talking to North Korea. There's a value, uh, exploratory talks. Uh, my, my probe, prod, and prove that we would probe their intentions, prod them to make the right decisions, and prove uh, propositions that we assume about North Korea's intent. We've shown that flexibility to engage uh, the DPRK unilaterally. Uh, to such a degree, I think, one can conclude that you know, queer, clearly the, the, the statement that Pyongyang wants nothing more than uh, a bilateral relationship with the United States really has to be questioned at some point. Uh, and indeed, the, the lesson that we've learned through our, through our past two decades or so of denuclearization uh, diplomacy is the need to make this a multilateral issue, to work cooperatively with China to engage the other six party partners, critical partners, uh, the Republic of Korea, Japan, and Russia at the six party talks table are the five countries that whose commitments to the DPRK provide the, the most opportune, optimal uh, environment in which it could move down the path of denuclearization and uh, secure the security assurances that the uh, the assistance, the aid, the, 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 the development that it purports to want through this process. Uh, so at the same time, uh, for six-party talks to be authentic and credible, they have to be about denuclearization. Uh, we need to be at the table talking about how the program is halted, how we move beyond a halt to disablement, get back on the road that you had worked so hard uh, during the Bush administration, which Chris Hill brought to uh, you know, as far as we could move in the 2008 period to resume that, that path has been our goal. And that's why, again, we have uh, stated that uh, uh, National Security Advisor Rice back in November, I believe, at Georgetown, mm -hmm. you, were, you hosted that, yeah. Yeah. you know, said that it would be hard to, to see uh, negotia negotiations as being credible well you know, the program continues to operate. And that's a type of, they're not really preconditions, it's just what authentic and credible negotiations would look like. And we are working hard, and there's a, I think there's a five-party consensus that resume six-party talks need to be about denuclearization, that the program needs to be halted, and, and North Korea needs to, to resume down that path. And I think there's also a consensus that the multilateral way forward is the best uh, possible solution toward that goal. And that's why we keep working at it. That's why we keep, you know, repeated, you know, diplomacy meeting with uh, our other four-party partners and 
trying to meet with Pyongyang, uh, but right now they're simply not respect, uh, responding. They're not, as, as our ROK colleagues are finding in their own efforts to try to engage the DPRK, they're simply not responsive right now. Mm -hmm. And then what about John's question about preconditions? Are there preconditions to coming back? Or? I, I wouldn't use the word preconditions. What we're, we're looking for is six-party talks that are authentic and credible by the fact that they're leading the concrete denuclearization steps, that we're, we're not going to the table and, and going through the litany of complaints and, and, and secondary issues that uh, aren't directly related to denuclearization, but that there's a clear signal from the DPRK that it is, uh, you know, its programs are going to be halted, all of its programs, its uranium enrichment program, its plutonium program, its missile launches, including satellite launches, its nuclear tests that well, authentic and credible negotiations are underway. These programs would be halted. And uh, then we could move back down that path of denuclearization that, uh, you know, the September 19th statement uh, spells out so clearly uh, mm -hmm. in the commitments of all the parties. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, I mean, I tend to agree with you. I mean, I think that there's a lot of speculation as to whether there are preconditions or things of this nature, but. Um, it's, it's not like North Korea is new to the table. They've been in this negotiation for a long time, and they know what the steps are. I mean, they know what the signals are and what the steps are to get back, and it just seems like they're not interested in, in, uh, in sending any of those signals right now. But before we go to the audience, let me just ask you one other question, and it's kind of an unfair question, but I'm going to ask you anyway, right. <laughs> which is um, um, what do you think uh, the North Koreans have learned from the Iran negotiation and where we are on the Iran negotiation? Well, since you said the North Koreans, uh, I'll open that up to maybe all 20 million of them, okay. <laughs> rather than trying to you know, speculate on what Kim Jong-un has, sure. has learned. Sure. Because I think the lesson of Iran, again, uh, is you know, the flexibility, it's the same lesson that, you know, Cuba and, and Burma brings. The flexibility, the creativity, the commitment to negotiations, the, the commitment to reach out to countries with whom we've had long, uh, have long have had differences, to pursue opportunities, to maintain capabilities, to not do so naively, to do so with pragmatism and principles, but pursue opportunities for dialogue, to, to imagine and begin to pursue transformation of, of a relationship mm -hmm. uh, that, you know, this is within the realm of possible. Mm -hmm. That whatever the, the, the internal and externally propagated narrative may be out of, out, out of uh, the DPRK leadership about a hostile United States that is out to crush North Korea and refuses to talk that indeed that is not the case, that we seek, you know, negotiations, that we seek a different path, that, that we and the other four parties, and indeed the entire international community, is looking for this type of policy shift mm -hmm. in Pyongyang, and that policy, policy shift would be positively responded to. Mm -hmm. uh, now, for those within the DPRK regime that, that feel, uh, you know, an undying commitment to pursue a capability, uh, even if it brings with it great economic deprivation and, and, and diplomatic isolation, uh, I, I really hate to think about what the lesson learned is. They may not have learned any lesson. If they would have learned any lesson, then you know, we would have perhaps seen it earlier. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. Okay. And then, Professor Zhao, in your comments, um, you mentioned that the, there's a very good relationship between Xi Jinping and Park Geun-hye. Um, and I guess the question is, from your perspective, um, you know, they're, they're, so there's clearly a strong bilateral economic relationship. They signed the beginning of an FTA agreement recently. Um, but is there a, do you, in, your, in your mind, is there a strategic angle to China's courting of South Korea? Is there a strategic angle? Do they see this as, um, while there's strong economic interest in the relationship, do they see this also as an opportunity to try to move South Korea away from the sort of traditional ba U.S.-based alliance network that South Korea has been such a big part of? Or 
I, is that something that um, is not really feasible, in, in your opinion? Uh, very good question, uh, Victor. Uh, my uh, uh, early uh, paper at different uh, uh, topic, I developed a notion called the due leadership in Asia Pacific. Uh, that is, uh, US and China uh, have different strengths uh, in different field. That is, China uh, emerging as a uh, leading influence uh, in terms of economic trade finance, uh, which demonstrated by the most recent AIIB development. At the same time, the United States is still a dominant power uh, in the dimension of the military and the security and the political influence. Uh, many countries in the region, uh, they may make a different choices. That is economically more dependent on relations with China, but the security and politically aligned with the United States. Uh, same, this kind of situation uh, with Korea, South Korea, Australia, uh, very clear. Japan still debating uh, the issue. Uh, so it's, it's to, to me, it's kind of a reality that is economically China and South Korea closer, uh, but militarily uh, US and South Korea still maintain its alliance. Uh, so, so in that sense, we do see uh, a rapid development and an improvement under Park and hai We understand the Li Ming Ba a little bit distance with Beijing, uh, but Park and hai uh, we, one example, not only FTA. Uh, last year, uh, Park Geun-hye took a 71 uh, member delegation to Beijing many uh, cooperation leaders and others. Early last year, when, when she visited Washington, it's only 54 members. It's a big delegation, but China even bigger. Uh, so I would say that because of the economic stakes uh, with that, uh, more than the development of bilateral relations between China and South Korea, even more than that, mm -hmm. there are so-called comprehensive relationship uh, with cultural uh, and social interactions. Mm -hmm. uh, we understand that uh, Park and Hai literally uh, the only non-English, non-Chinese speaker who can deliver lecture in both English and Chinese. Mm -hmm. it's, it's very rare, uh, this kind of uh, talent. Mm -hmm. and, and the Chinese society and the elites really like that kind of gesture. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, Park Geun Hai visited Xi'an uh, in one of uh, her, her visits. So, uh, all of that indicating uh, uh, close ties. I guess China also realistic enough, uh, thinking that uh, it's not able to even take a lead in military and the political dimension. Mm -hmm. So China would accept the basic fact that uh, South Korea is one of the uh, very close allies to the United States. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, but at the same time, uh, we do see in many policy choices, uh, South Korea uh, maintained in a way it's kind of a neutral and a selective uh, I was told, for example, the most recent round of AIIB uh, uh, development, uh, so had already pre, I was told, uh, is pre-decided that South Korea would join, but purposely waited until not only British, France, Italy, but also other uh, members join, and then South Korea, uh, at last minute, announced that it would not uh, uh, offend uh, Washington in a way. Uh, so I guess this reflects a kind of a clever of diplomacy, but also reflect reality 
between uh, China, United States, and South mm -hmm. Korea. Mm -hmm. Thanks, thanks. Yeah, I mean, I think one of the reasons why the big difference between Lee myung and Park geun in terms of relations with China is that, of course, it was during Lee myung that you had North Korean behavior that really tested the China-South Korea relationship, like the Chanan yeah. sinking and the Waipido shelling. And, and under, under Park geun we really haven't had the North Korea event that really tests the China-South Korea relationship. I mean, in a, that, and that's a good thing. I mean, that's a good thing that it's been that way. So, um, well, thank, thanks for those uh, very astute observations. We'll now go to the, um, to the audience um, to have uh, some question and answer. Um, uh, the first question is go, goes to Chris, and then we'll go here. So. And we have Mike Runners, yeah. who will give you a mic. So, um, Chris Nelson, Nelson Report, <laughs> over here. Yeah, um, sure. <laughs> thanks so much. Re great discussion, as always. Um, Sid re uh, has repeatedly talked about something that's really important, and that is how to sharpen the choices. So I wanted to ask uh, a, a question with two parts about sharpening. First, on the economic side of it, and then second, on something that we haven't, hasn't come up yet, and that's the human rights side. Um, there's, as long as China and now presumably Russia are going to continue uh, fairly deep economic relations uh, with, uh, with the DPRK, what does sharpen the choice mean? Uh, and aren't we sort of stuck in a contradiction there in a sense that we want them to, to develop a better economy because that opens things up, and yet if they develop a better economy and their nukes then my God, we've got the worst of both worlds. We've got a success, an economically successful nuclear, nuclear state. What the hell do we do? So I think it'd be interesting to see how, how we think about, how you think about that contradiction and our Chinese and Russian friends continuing their economic support. How do you sharpen it? And uh, then is perhaps the human rights area, uh, particularly with the UN, the UN report and all that, is that an area to sharpen uh, uh, choices for the for North Korea, and if so, how? Because uh, uh, it seems like we're chasing our tails a bit, and it's not anybody's fault. It's you know it's just what we're dealing with. So thanks. Yeah, very very difficult, uh, but uh, insightful questions, and certainly ones that uh, we talk about and think about often. Uh, you you characterize. The, the growing DPRK Russia, DPRK China uh, economic relationships as fairly deep. And I think you know, that is uh, uh, an important question to move beyond the headlines and to look at, at first of all, what the, the true substance is. And then secondly, to, to ask the question about whether when we proclaim Byungjin, this dual pursuit policy, as, as a dead end, as we have uh, publicly. Uh, and we say, you know, in more specific terms, that North Korea will not attain its, its economic development objectives as long as it, it uh, refuses to denuclearize. It's not a, it's meant to be intimidating or, or coercive language. It's, it's just a conclusion that when you look at the, the international sanctions regime that the DPRK is under, uh, as focused as it is on the WMD capabilities, you know, it's clear, and, and the, uh, the outlier status that the DPRK has, not only because it's denuclearization program, but because of its, its, its uh, ignoring of international norms and laws and standards and its human rights issue, the, we, we're all familiar with the package, that DPRK will not be able to attain its, its broad economic goals. Uh, unless it chooses a, a different path. And, you know, to the degree to which uh, there will be rising expectations, uh, perhaps even with some of the development that we've heard is taking place, the improvement of the economic conditions on the ground, the rising expectations of the North Korean people as information uh, flows increasingly into the DPRK, the pressure uh, that, that challenges, the pressure will grow that challenges uh, the policy path that the leadership has chosen. And so, you know, what we need to uh, make sure is that Pyongyang here is in stereophonic sound, uh, certainly from the other four members of the six party talks, but from the international community, is that the true peace and prosperity it seeks 
will only come through denuclearization. Uh, you raised the human rights issue, and it's a very important issue. It's, it's, it's something that uh, is obviously a very high priority to follow on the excellent Commission of Inquiry report and the momentum that's been gained in that realm. And, and my colleague, uh, Special Envoy Bob King, worked extremely hard with the international community, and that's a key point. Uh, this is an international issue. The U.S. is deeply concerned about the situation in North Korea, but it's not standing alone as the only country. The international community has resoundedly uh, uh, pointed to the, the results of the Commission of Inquiry report, the need to hold uh, those responsible for the atrocities contained in that report accountable. And, and that will also be, uh, first and foremost, something we need to do. It's, it's the morally correct thing to do. It's what, you know, why the, the COI was stood up and conducted and the report issued. Most, most importantly, it, it sends another signal to the DPRK that its, its behavior outside of the international system, uh, it's, it's, it's near anachronistic uh, behavior in this day and age, uh, is simply uh, not going to be accepted by the international community. That's why we said that the pursuit of denuclearization and improved human rights situation in North Korea are not mutually uh, exclusive goals, and we can, we can pursue both simultaneously, and they're reinforcing. Right, thanks. Uh, yes, your question here. Yeah. Thank you very much for your great conversation. My name is Takahiro Motegi. I'm a CSIS Japan Fellows, uh, sorry, Japan Fellows, Japan Chairs Visiting Fellow. I'd like to ask a question to Zhang, Zhao Quansheng Lao Shi. Well, I'd like to ask you the question about the, you mentioned the limitation that you mentioned. So I think China has a very big influence to North Korea. And what I want to ask you is, what is the biggest reason that China's influence has decreased to North Korea? Does it make sense? Um, yeah, thank you very much. So what's the biggest reason China's influence has decreased yeah. in North yeah. Korea? Yeah. Yeah. Um, as uh, Sini early pointed out correctly, uh, China uh, has much bigger economic uh, bilateral trade, like you mentioned, 45 times with South Korea than with uh, North Korea, DPRK. So economically, uh, China much closer to South Korea. Uh, that is also conducive for China its own modernization uh, from early time, but now uh, global so-called uh, China dream and all those kind of. Uh, uh, so in other words, North Korea, uh, the portion uh, of importance, I would say, uh, declined over the time. Uh, by the same token, uh, North Korea uh, has increasingly uh, indicate its uh, preference uh, to develop relations with Washington. Uh, and uh, uh, at the same time, uh, China uh, had internal policy debate, uh, particularly uh, over uh, whether uh, the amount uh, of economic, including food and energy, uh, would be maintained the same or would reduce. Uh, so, so, you know, a lot of this kind of a policy debate, I'm not sure about exactly, you know, what uh, the amount now, uh, energy and food, uh, but I was told it's declined, reduced over the time. Uh, so the importance declined and the supply declined, that also making, uh, I would say, China's influence over uh, Pyongyang also uh, had limitation. So that's pretty uh, much the current uh, situation. Having said that, like I mentioned earlier, uh, internally there are another school of thought uh, emphasizing uh, should restore or should recover uh, the relations with Pyongyang. Nevertheless, it's not totally up to Beijing. It is pretty much uh, to see whether North Korea, as we mentioned earlier, 
uh, you know, many diplomatic uh, activities from Pyongyang uh, is not stable, is sometimes not predictable. Uh, so one cannot rule out uh, a possibility that is all of a sudden there is an improvement relationship between Pyongyang and Beijing, you know, leading to a top leaders meeting. Uh, but we have not yet see, seen that development yet. Uh, Mike? Uh, following up on the last question, uh, you, you talked about the internal debate over China's policy towards North Korea, and you mentioned sort of old school approach of, of, of uh, wanting to maintain North Korea as a buffer or, or a barrier. I'm wondering about the other side of that debate, the people on the other side of that debate. Uh, are they simply saying the negative, no, we need to reassess our relationship and move away from this old uh, formula? Or are there positive, uh, concrete proposals they're putting forward for a new type of relationship with, with North Korea? And Ambassador Saylor, if related to that, I, I could ask you, obviously there's been traditional Chinese concern over uh, the security of the Korean Peninsula, including American presence there. Um, do you think there's a usefulness and prospect for some sort of exploratory talks where the cooperation between U.S. and China actually starts to include some sort of agreement over future security arrangements that would address these Chinese concerns? Yeah. Uh, to answer your question uh, about another side of debate, I guess one word uh, can, can be used to make a summary, that is liability. Uh, that group of thought saying that uh, uh, North Korea uh, may no longer be a asset to Chinese national interest, but rather liability. So China should further reduce its relationship uh, with Pyongyang. Uh, by meaning of that, it's a uh, nuclear test. Uh, this really disregard uh, China's warning number of times, so now do it. But Pyongyang just continue. And one of them even uh, during the uh, uh, Chinese uh, New Year time, and then very close to uh, North Korea-China border, uh, that kind of behavior uh, really upset many uh, Chinese uh, scholars, uh, think tank, uh, policy makers. Uh, so and a, a few years back, uh, there was a journal uh, in China called Zhan Lie Yu Guan Li, Strategy and Management. And there was even an article uh, published uh, proposing we should have a new thinking of a Korea policy. Uh, we should move away uh, from traditional uh, thinking. Uh, but of course, that you know, kind of thing was criticized. It's not really official. But the very fact, that kind of article even uh, was published uh, is kind of an interesting development. So what I'm saying here is we do see uh, you know, that over different conference, uh, there are, you know, that same journal also published a group of articles about Japan policy, saying that we should a new, have a new thinking of Japan policy. So like I mentioned earlier, uh, there are already much more pluralistic in terms of different strategic thinking among scholars, think tanks, uh, debating uh, the issue, and uh, particularly uh, with another uh, Uncertain question uh, is about the, the future development of North Korea. R remember, uh, North Korea mentioned a number of times it would also emphasize in economic development to improve people's living standard. So the, a, a huge question is that whether North Korea would, would be able to so-called follow footstep of China's reform. You know, China opened, and in early time, the practice is whenever, like a Kim Jong 
Kinjong, not Kinjong Un, but Kinjong Yu, when 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 the, when leader from North Korea visit uh, China, uh, Chinese leaders always took them to Shanghai and Shenzhen as a showcase. You know, here, you know, uh, same thing with Burma, mm -hmm. Burmese leader, military leader. Mm -hmm. so that is maybe this is the way you should. Uh, but uh, but uh, so there is a huge debate whether North Korea would actually could be able to follow. Uh, so far now, is we don't really see that happening, but that's always a potential. David? Uh, on the question of, of a, a future Korean peninsula and what type of uh, force posture there would be, what type of deterrence would be necessary, it, it is the, you know, it stretches the hypothetical of hypotheticals. But, you know, that said, the September 19, 2005 joint statement uh, you know, included uh, language in there on uh, the responsibility of the other five parties in response to North Korea moving down the road of denuclearization of uh, showing mutual respect for sovereignty of normalizing relations and, of course, negotiating a permanent peace regime. Uh, as we began to move, make progress uh, in implementing the September 19th statement with the first and second phase action statements, in fact, a, a working group on, called Northeast Asia Peace and Security Mechanism was established that was you know, based upon the idea that once denuclearization began to unfold, uh, we would begin work on uh, those elements related to confidence building measures on the regime. Uh, and, and we've always asserted, of course, that it's, it's very difficult to think of confidence building measures. It's, it's, it's impossible to think of tension reduction as long as North Korea continues to refuse to denuclearize and, in fact, quantitatively and qualitatively attempts to improve its arsenal. Uh, so it's, 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 pre it's premature to discuss that, but certainly uh, in terms of the, the, the quality of, of the discussion that we have with China, you know, these types of things uh, in an ideal, you know, uh, scenario moving forward could be discussed, but right now we're at a point where you know, the North Korea threat is, is not decreasing and, and it's really impossible to begin to think about, uh, you know, such a scenario. Well, um, unfortunately, we've run out of time. So um, I want to thank you both for taking the time to join us this morning. Uh, well, thank you all for joining us here at CSIS. Thanks to GPF for working with us on this and all of you have a nice day. Thank you very much.